Tonight I'll be talking about spirituality in graphic novels or pop theosophy. Theosophy is, among many things, a philosophy for personal growth and self-transformation. And over the years, as graphic novels have evolved, it has been sort of hidden in plain sight among these art forms. So that is how it means pop theosophy, theosophy and pop culture. Graphic novels are epics in their own right. And spirituality is its own subgenre in epics. I'm going to talk about, in a Joseph Campbell sense, some of the symbols that we find in spiritual graphic novels specifically. So not all comic books, I would say, would give lessons on spiritual progress or spiritual initiation. But uh, mostly what I'm interested in talking about is the comic books that do talk about that spirituality. And we're going to go over some of those symbols. Uh, Joseph Campbell, uh, whom some of you may know about, was a student of Carl Jung. And he wrote several books like The Power of Myth and The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he talks about a cyclical myth, cyclical epic, that can be used for personal growth. Uh, in those books, the specific category of epic is called apotheosis. That is to say, elevating to divinity. And so it's sort of a subgenre of the epic myth. And that is spirituality when applied to the mythic epic. Uh, it's a apotheosis. Another reason in which I consider graphic novels to be an excellent exercise of spirituality is the idea of beginner's mind. Uh, not only do, does the hero in graphic novels always represent a newcomer to the world and the idea of a fresh approach, which we can learn from through the character, but fans of science fiction or fantasy fiction are much more prone to the idea of willing suspension of disbelief. That is to say, they're willing to go along with the ideas before them. The quote says, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are only few. Sometimes the ideas in our individual practices, whatever religion we are, become so familiar to us, it becomes almost a rote machine. And so we stop paying attention to what it truly means. And art and prose really give an entirely new perspective of ideas we may already be very much familiar with. So I would say that comic books or graphic novels, they're one and the same, uh, is an excellent practice in seeing ideas we're very familiar with in a whole new light. It's necessary that you understand a few key concepts. Uh, I was talking about Joseph Campbell. There's archetypes and motifs that are common throughout apotheosis epics and dream imagery, familiar with Carl Jung, as well as symbols we might find in the scriptures. So you, might, so you find that these comic books which we're going to look at have very much the same instructional value as a scripture would. And if there's one point I would like you all to take away from this talk, it's that the idea, it's the idea that stories, and it doesn't have to be comic books, it can be any type of epic spiritual fiction, have instructions for a type of self-transformation. They teach the value that our true identity is not so much how we see as our individual selves as individual human beings, but our true identity is with the absolute, uh, with the unknowable mystery, so to speak, uh, which is a familiar idea in many faiths. So it's truly a theosophical idea.
So I'm going to tell you the generic story. That's the easiest way to approach this. In any spiritual epic, there's always the stage where the hero finds the sacred object. If I were to explain to you that I have this object or this thing that is the greatest treasure in the world, and not only is it infinitely valued, but it will make you invincible, one's mind would go wild with the possibilities of what that could be. It's very much an idea of pearls before swine, the idea of pearls being wisdom. So I'm describing this object, which I will get to, and that is what the object could be. It could be the main character's ability that he discovers, and here it's Thor, and he's wielding a hammer, but it's the idea of Excalibur. There, there's something that makes the main character important, and if it's an object, it inherently belongs to him. And then from that point, he meets the beloved other. It's usually a romantic interest, and in the generic concept, the hero is a man, and he meets a woman whom he rescues. And if it's like a children's story, for example, because they make spiritual epics for children as well, it might be a very close friend or in, in one of the comic books, we'll be talking about uh, it's a guardian angel, that kind of thing. Uh, and that will continue over and over, and it can do infinitely. And I, I think that is what makes the difference between uh, normal epics and what I would define as spiritual epics, is a normal epic will continue the cycle over and over again. Uh, the hero gains the object of power. He meets the princess or his significant other. He gains further confidence in using it. They get married. So there's, con there's this constant back and forth. But in a spiritual graphic novel, eventually he will destroy the object willingly. So not so much in the sense that the sword's broken and reforged. He willingly gives it up. The final stage is that he finds victory through some level of deep understanding. He's no longer going to fight and Many interpreters of the story might confuse this or misinterpret it as sacrifice, but it's usually that the main character has come to a deeper understanding that there is no such thing as sacrifice uh, in whatever the story may be. So now we're going to interpret this and help you understand it from a spiritual perspective. The sacred object, and here I have Thor, Green Lantern and uh, the character of the Sentry. Uh, as above, so below. As the ego is to the monad, so the personality to the ego. The sacred object represents what we call the monad. The easiest way to, ex entire books have been, in fact, that's an entire book written about it, but the easiest way to understand it is, it is the spark within all of us that is a part of the absolute. It, it is a part of God, so to speak. So it is what makes us divine. And in the beginning, the hero sees this as this external idea, uh, this object to wield. He's beginning to understand it. And so it is viewed as a treasure which makes him invincible. So the idea of joining with his beloved, it's an experiential idea. It's the idea of longing for union with the divine. And this is from Jeffrey Hodson, a Hidden Wisdom in the Holy Bible. Marriage and intercourse, whether legal or illicit, refer not to any carnal relationship, but to a spiritual marriage or blending of consciousness. The physical waking consciousness can be elevated into union with that of the inner spiritual self. And he's talking about specifically about certain passages in the Bible, but as I said, these ideas are universal, and uh, as Carl Jung discussed, they are archetypes in the collective unconscious. They represent an idea within us that is inherent. So as I said, there's a back and forth. Usually, the main character rescues his other, and the other rescues him back and forth. And as Joseph Campbell says, is the male figure may be regarded as symbolizing the initiating principle or the method, 
in which case the female denotes the goal to which initiation leads. But this goal is nirvana. And that is the idea that there is a practice and there is an experience. Except the basic idea that, you know, the pearl, they express it as, is this idea of intimate love, uh, which is very much how many Jewish faith, uh, Jewish branches, and um, Sufism will describe the type of affection you should have for God. It's a uh, near romantic relationship. It's an idea of deep devotion and love. No spiritual practice advances just from a methodology. You know, no one prays or practices a type of meditation never having a mystical experience. And no one has significant mystical experiences without a practice, without a method. So that is what those ideas symbolize. Many here, or many stories, many comic books may limit it to only that, because these next two concepts are very hard to express in a plot. They will allude to them, but they might not execute them. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So again, from Jeffrey Hodson, different book though, Pathway to Perfection. Never again need form delude and capture him, even though he must return to life and form, for now he knows the one eternal life and has been made one with that, the absolute, which abides therein, the life embodied universal mind. And he's describing something in theosophy, which we also call he who does not return. It's a state a stage in the initiation where he is not perfected, but he has tained, attained a perfect sense of uh, identity or place in the universe. And that's described through the breaking of the object. No longer does he see the monad as an idea that's beyond him or this external like lamp that grants wishes. It's inside of him or her, and it is an internal thing, and he's come to realize that. The next stage is the level of what in Buddhism they call the arhat. The practitioner has attained total cleansing of one's karma. They realize that life and death are no different. What Annie Besant says about it is the eternal, the undying, the ancient and the constant, he lives in that, and there is nothing that can shake his serenity. So symbolically, somewhere between the third step and the fourth step, th the main character sheds off this relationship with their beloved, whether they break up or oftentimes in an epic, the other character dies, and then, then he comes to term with it in the, the final stage where he submits himself to the process entirely. But the, sim the symbolism of letting the other die is similar to the idea in theosophy of sort of ridding oneself of a concept of the causal body. And that is, the causal body is essentially similar to the idea of karma. It means you're cleansing yourself entirely of it. Again, as I said many times, the last two stages in comic books or any fiction are not completely expressed, partially because in a story, in a fiction, there's a level of catharsis on the reader. And what the stories intend to do is to inspire you to move farther. Like I said, they'll allude to the fact that the second two steps are down the road, but it won't complete it. The other reason that it's often not in a story is because it stops the story dead. Um, and, you know, well, how are you going to continue a story after they've attained a level of inner peace and they no longer see a need to fight? It's difficult to make a story out of that. In fact, the only stories I've seen, and inevitably, the audience will walk away confused is um, one of the books which I'll be talking about is The Fountain, which they also made a movie out of, and it went over at a lot of people's heads. Um, the Sandman, which was written by Neil Gaiman, 
who's a, a celebrated author. And um, this isn't a comic book, but the Matrix movies, uh, the second and third Matrix, I would say, are in their own in their own way a unique story. You don't have to watch the first one if you were going to rewatch them. Just watch the second and the third one, and they go through each of these steps uh, all the way to completion. And in the end, the main character, it's not so much that he sacrifices himself; it's that he realizes the essence of himself, which is an eternal identity. Uh, another one is Harry Potter. In that instance, there's always, in an epic, characters which the main character will meet along the way, which will exemplify virtues he's gradually retaining. But the only character who has the only character who is the one, so to speak, the monad, is the main character. And that actually brings, thanks for asking that, Ed, uh, because that, that's a very important understanding of the story is that it's what's called a micros, microcosmic perspective, is that everything that's happening in an entire story is happening inside the one individual. So there's always the one object, or even the main character himself will be the one most important thing within the whole story. And that, if it's within the human being, represents the monad itself. The other characters are like facets of the human being, uh, virtues, uh, flaws, what have you. But only the main character represents the monad. So I would say even in that story, they kind of, like I said, they allude to the fact that it's down the road, uh, but it's they don't complete it because... Did you read the last book? Yeah. Harry... He died. Not Harry Potter. Yes, he comes back, exactly. So that's my point. And, then, and this is another example of that idea of going towards the final stages, but they kind of bring it back. And in this case, the comic book is Doctor Strange, which we have in the library. It's Doctor Strange into Shambhala, and Hamir is a fellow disciple of their master, and Hamir has attained that state, and they kind of merge, and this very well describes the idea of the fourth stage, or the Arhat, void, form, time, ego, illusion, and behind it all, beyond it all, within it all, a power, a light, a presence, Stephen Strange melts away, Hamir melts away. Everything I see, everywhere I look, every soul entwined, every soul am I. Oh, call me parent, child, master, disciple, Maya, reality. I'm the planner and the plan, creation and creator. Oh, I am, which of course sounds like Om. And if you see, it's just a little Easter egg, I guess. That symbol right there looks very familiar. Uh, it's the, the, the six-pointed star. You can kind of see it. That is the basic idea which I would like you all to take away and possibly apply to other fictions, other uh, science fictions or spiritual books. Um, now we're going to look at the specific ones. This is Promethea. It was written by a very well-known and celebrated writer named Ellen Moore. And as the name suggests, Prometheus, it's very much a wisdom, tradition, mystery book. In fact, he's so well read, I'm sure there's many references to things that I might not get, but inspires you to read further. And there's the Kajikis and a great deal of sim symbolism and imagery from Egyptian and Hermetic philosophies. And he, he is himself a self-professed pagan. It's interesting. Uh, how much he knows just about mystery religions. Very much in the book, he plays upon the idea of, of the realm of ideas, the aspect of the collective human consciousness. And he demonstrates that here by uh, Thoth and Hermes kind of being the same person combined at the hip. Hermes is uh, a Greek god, but He's also referencing the Hermetic tradition, Hermes Trismegistus, and he's 
like a symbol of divine knowledge, and so is Thoth uh, from the Egyptian tradition, and many people combine the two, and so this is kind of, it's almost like a joke, but it's also an allusion to the idea of what kind of story this is. Here, I'm not going to read the whole dialogue, but she is having a dialogue with a, it would essentially represent her higher self, and she's in a realm called the Immateria, and they're discussing how not only is there real physical chairs, but in the Immateria there's the idea of chairs, and every thought you ever have actually exists somewhere, which I think would sound like a very strange concept to most people, but in the Theosophical Society, we have many writers on that very subject, and I would encourage everyone who is either interested in that book to read Thought Forms by Annie Besant and Leadbeater and The Astral Plane by C.W. Leadbeater, and vice versa. If you enjoy the concepts in these books, I would encourage you to read Promethea. Alan Moore spends a lot of time explaining how he perceives magic is not the same way as lighting candles and facing the four corners or any kind of rote ceremony. He sees magic very much as having to do with art and artistic expression. And he laments the fact that most of what he considers magic today is an advertising convincing people to buy the products that they want to buy. And so the reason I bring up that point is he spent a lot of time in this book expressing the pages themselves as like stained glass windows. The layout itself has significance. Many of them look like mandala spreads. This too, he spends an entire chapter on the tarot cards explaining how he perceives them. And predictably, it goes over the heads of a lot of the readers. And so a lot of these end up being very much underground concepts that are hard to find and hard to grasp in and of themselves. In fact, again to the Matrix movies, I recall the Wachowskis had two bonus features. One was by popular movie critics. The other one was by Ken Wilber and uh, another philosopher. Just to express the point that the common everyday public when confronted with these ideas or the popular, popular critiques are not going to get it. But if you look a little deeper, there's a much more valuable expression in these art forms besides just entertainment. That's Alan Moore. <laughs> yeah, uh, nice looking guy. Again, uh, as a pagan, he expresses that he believes in the idea of a, man, a monadic god, but he also believes that we're never going to get it. Uh, we're never going to completely comprehend it. So he sees no point in praying to a god as if we're understanding exactly how to communicate it, communicate to it. So as he explains it, religion should be more diverse, different ways of viewing it of the absolute is like spelling with an alphabet. There's many different letters to do so and otherwise with one letter you're just making one vowel sounds like ooh and it sounds like a monkey. So he, he has a very good sense of humor about that sort of thing but he has a lot to say and I think he expressed a lot of it in the book Promethea. There's an artist illustration of him, and the quote I have here says, We could, were we to decide, ensure that current occultism be remembered in the history of magic as a fanfare peak rather than as a fading sigh. We could insist upon it were we truly what we say we are. We could achieve it not by scrawling sigils, but by crafting stories, paintings, symphonies. We could allow our art to spread its holy psychedelic scarab wings across society once more, perhaps in doing so, allow some light or grace to fall upon that pained, benighted organism. The next comic I would like to talk about is The Fountain. 
it was made into a movie as well. And this is an excellent story. Uh, sometimes the stories of the authors or the creation of the comic books, I find, are just as interesting as the stories themselves. Darren Aronofsky, a very talented director, wrote this story and he couldn't find the funding to make it. He needed to get this story out of him so badly that he, he created the comic book version of him and he got a very talented artist, Kent Williams, to make the whole book. Oh, I have a quote by him. He says, it's something deep down in your stomach telling you not to give up or quit. It's that voice screaming in your head, keeping you awake at night. The story of the fountain was one I believed in. When I spent so much time and effort on trying to get right, I couldn't give up on it. Or more to the point, the story wouldn't let me give up on it. So this is truly spiritual expression. Many of them contain this sense of raw expression that is spiritual, regardless of whether it's an instructional course on initiation or personal evolution. And that's why I felt that this one was an excellent example of that. The movie and the comic book had very poor reviews. He says, anytime you try to, and bring spirituality into the narrative form, there are certain people who really just want their entertainment as a very spoon-fed, straight-ahead story. The fountain has that, but it also is open to the biggest question that people have been asking since the dawn of time. Why are we here? Why do we die? What is life? What is love? When you ask those types of questions, a lot of people just don't care to think about them. So this story also falls very well into the path of the spiritual epic. There's a great deal about Buddhism in it, and there's also a lot about reincarnation. It follows one character through three of his lives. In his first life, he is a conquistador by the name of Thomas and in his, which in the 1500s, his second life, uh, 2000, around the year 2000 or current time period, he's a cancer surgeon by the name of Tommy. And in the 2500s, he's this astronaut, as we see here, in kind of a very organic, trippy space capsule by the name of Tom, which I suspect is also a reference to the David Bowie songs about Major Tom about an astronaut who goes into space and doesn't come back. It's not so much a superhero story or even a, an epic myth. So th there is no Excalibur. In this sense, the quality that sets him apart from others is his tenacity and his disbelief that death is necessary. And that's what makes, that's what drives him throughout the entire story. And in this one, it, this frame in particular, he's, the spaceship is sort of running out of juice and he's insisting that they're going to live and make it to this dying star which will somehow give him immortality because his fear throughout all of these three lives is that he has to die which is also a type of irony because he has three lifetimes to be afraid of death but of course he doesn't remember all of them. And the other two stories at the top in blue is him as a, as a doctor. The significant other in this instant would be his wife Izzy and when he's a conquistador it's the Queen of Spain, Isabella, and then in his final life it's this memory of his wife who's represented by this tree which is in the spaceship with him growing organically and he's trying to keep it alive because it's like the memory of his wife. There's very much also a theme, aside from Buddhism, is the Garden of Eden, which is an excellent parable about physical incarnation. Leaving the Garden of Eden and toiling represents the idea of leaving paradise or heaven and coming down here. So there's a constant theme of the Garden of Eden as well as a Buddhist idea. So as the formula corresponds, initially he has this tenacity and then he gains strength from his significant other in all three lives. It's a, it's a complicated and 
very fluid story, excellently done. The, this is Isabella from Spain, and there's this idea of union, and you can see in the artist's rendition, he has this deep yearning, which again, if you didn't understand that it was a spiritual metaphor for a yearning for God, might go over your head. So he goes through each of the stages, and this is his, him finally coming to terms at the end of his third life with a sense of peace, uh, which is represented in the stage of the Arhat. And I think this is an excellent representation of this idea. He says, now I understand. I know how it ends. I will remember, remember all of it so that I can finally forget. In some branches of Buddhism, and in other spirituality, they believe once you attain that stage, your entire past lives are laid out before you and you recall all of them. You're at a stage in your evolution where you're moving on beyond that. I'd like to talk about three other comic books, which I won't go into as much depth as those first two, but I feel that they should at least be mentioned and I'd like to point out a few themes in, in each of them. This one is Hunter, the Age of Magic. It's about a young man who is sort of like the reincarnation of the wizard Merlin, and he's in this white school. It, it's a very long and interesting story that kind of plays off of that, the idea that he is the Merlin. So it's not like he finds an external object. He is the object. Sometimes the bend of the stories signifies the kind of point what they're going to emphasize in the process. Like in Lord of the Rings, for example, the, the one ring was destined from the very beginning to be destroyed. So it wasn't like towards the end it was a shocker that they would destroy this object of power. So you already knew where it was going to go. So in this one, Hunter the Age of Magic, they're setting it up for a more enlightened perspective. It's, it's not going to take a gradual realization of his importance and the significance of the other and that sort of thing. Another theme in this book is the idea of the logos. And they explore that concept from its metaphorical perspective. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In countless myths across the realms, the universe is created with a word. That first word, the Logos, begins a discourse, an ongoing stream of language which gives shape and meaning to everything, the language of creation. So they explore the idea of what is creation, what is this language that the universe is written in, and they really carry that metaphor in a lot of ways. And they also talk about the Garden of Eden, the enemies who are tracking him down, want everything to go back to the way it was, back to the paradise of the Garden of Eden. And he and his friends try to convey to them that the correct way is not to go back, but to go forward. In other words, there's a reason for the fall, and it's so you can come back to this idea of this enlightened grace, which is represented by the diagram of apotheosis. Another theme in the story, which I think is very theosophical, is the idea that everyone's spiritual path is their own. And he says, there are no masters here. Everyone is a student, even Renfrew, their teacher. It's just that some of them think they know more than everyone else. That doesn't give them the right to tell you what you can or can't do. And there's also this metaphor, you know, this archetype of the door. And he can show her the door, but he can't open the door for her. And that's what's illustrated here. Another comic book is Will World, which is a Green Lantern story, which is kind of a mainstream comic. But sometimes you get an artist or a writer who is allowed to do something interesting, even with these mainstream characters. And those are really interesting because these are typically these very low brow kind of fighting comics, but sometimes you get to see them from a different perspective. And J.M. De Matese says, Will World is one of those stories where within the context of a cosmic fantasy, it's really more like a children's book than a superhero story. 
I was able to share my views on life, the universe, and everything. And, and the cover very much alludes to the idea of a microcosmic perspective because there's this dream imagery that, that permeates the whole book. There's these little things going on that have nothing to do with the story that just feel like dream subject matter. Every city, every building in the city looks like a hodgepodge and there's monkeys in the catacombs there and it's just kind of random. And in this case, the significant other is this angel whom he feels he can remember from like a childhood memory or something like that. And it's kind of vague, but it expresses that they, in essence, are a part of each other. And that in theosophy is very much like the ego in, in response to the Buddha consciousness, this idea of intuition and logic. Joseph Campbell explains that one of the archetypes is males are usually this idea of logic and women are this idea of intuition, which is why if uh, a woman is the main character, uh, they'll have an intuitive understanding, but they'll meet this male other that will give them sort of a logical perspective on things. A lot of artists, what they learn is to learn the rules so you can break the rules. So sometimes they may have a female main character which may have masculine features and it'll be more of like a male-oriented story or vice versa. And even when I was going to art school, I remember uh, my teacher told all of us that she really wanted to ingrain the rules of art to us. And she said, a good artist knows all the rules so they can learn how to break them. And every story, the whole idea of it being having a beginner's mind is an integral part of that. To look at it from a new perspective involves breaking the rules. And this scene right here, she's explaining to him that he can see past the illusions, which would be his gift, his weapon, how he perceives the monad is this idea of cosmic awareness. And eventually he's willing to integrate it within himself and have confidence in that. And here he, he reaches a state where he's beginning to see the truth. It's very similar to the scene in Doctor Strange. He says, I believe I am the creator, the sustainer, the destroyer. And I finally remember the words, those precious words, I understand now what they mean, who I am. In the story, he's talking about the Green Lantern mantra, they say. But I feel it's a, an allusion to scriptures themselves or stories themselves. The idea that words or stories could convey this deeper truth. The path towards that enlightenment is not so much learning something new, but remembering it because it's a part of us. Silver Surfer is an easy comic book to represent spirituality. It's been like that since its creation. Here he kind of looks like the cross in a way. He's always been this angelic figure. They explain his power as the idea of the power cosmic. In this story, there's the idea of Galactus, who's this Gnostic god, this ignorant god. And it's very much a Promethean idea as well, this idea of forbidden knowledge coming from on high, because Prometheus in the Greek myth was punished for what he gave to the humans by Zeus. And this myth is very much permeated in a lot of these comic books, so I felt this was a quintessential example. Jack Kirby was the illustrator, Stan Lee was the writer, but Jack Kirby created the story itself. He says, and for some reason I went to the Bible and I came up with Galactus. And there I was in front of this tremendous figure who I knew very well because I've always felt him and I certainly couldn't treat him the same way that I would any mortal. And they're showing Galactus as a god and all these people are in awe of him, but it's mostly a fearful awe. And it very much plays on the idea of what we might perceive as God is not really the true God, because how could it be? And this is 
the significance of the monadic element in the, the Silver Surfer, the idea that he is the one. He is, in a microcosmic perspective, the character which represents the monad, but he has internally a quality that he is beginning to grasp. And in this one they say there are some who cannot flee, and there are some with the speed and the power cosmic. So that's what makes him different from the rest of the characters. This is a very interesting quote by Jack Kirby. He says, everybody thinks he's a god, but he's the devil, referring to the Silver Surfer. The Silver Surfer is the fallen angel. So God zapped him and said, well, you're going to hell, and that's where he sent him. And where the hell is the Silver Surfer? Among us. Again, sort of a Gnostic perspective, or, or even a Promethean perspective, that we're trying to get out of the imprisonment of mortal life. The way to get there is to destroy this concept we have of a false god and come to a conclusion of a better one, which is that we are part of the absolute. As I, as I was saying, it's very much a Promethean myth, which I feel is a good one to end on because it's very theosophical. For example, HBB, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society wrote this magazine called Lucifer, which was also an idea of knowledge descending from above and a, a very misinterpreted knowledge uh, in the sense that she knew people wouldn't understand it or might react to it improperly, but that there's something sacred in what they misjudge. So I feel it, it also ties into looking at comic books as a valid art form for wisdom knowledge. And finally, I have a list of the books which I would recommend for one reason or another. Some of them explain this kind of instruction of personal evolution. Some of them are just very heartfelt stories which I feel belong in there. And some of them are in our library, as of course are all the theosophical <coughs> books which I mentioned. Any questions? Yes. Okay, so um, I know you mentioned um, when a hero has like a relationship with a significant other, mm -hmm. it represents um, like a higher love for a higher power, mm -hmm. like, kind of like that. Um, and you mentioned like how in these graphic novels, it like the symbolism flies by people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say about graphic novels that they represent women in like a sexual way. Mm -hmm. So in keeping with the symbolism, how should you look at the way women are portrayed? Like, is this, am I, clear? I would say in most common graphic novels, it's portrayed exactly like what you're saying. It's just to sell the book. But in spiritual comic books, there's always a reason for it. And, and there's always a deeper aspect to it. And I'm going to go back to the there. If you notice, both of these concepts parallel each other. There's this very base idea of physical attraction. And then on the higher levels, it's more a fulfillment of that. The fulfillment of that yearning is a union with the divine. So sexual imagery or the portrayal of the other, whether it's a woman or the man, is characteristic of the main character's yearning for this divine presence. But you kind of have to differentiate the difference between what I would call spiritual graphic novels and just the general ones. A lot of times it's just to sell the comic book. Are spiritual graphic novels um, intended to be just that, or is it that the, I guess, is it the author saying, well, this is some neat subject matter. It may beef up my story. So are they, um, I guess, conceived spiritually and executed that way, or do they just borrow the material? And also, is it, I guess, is it its own separate genre in the world of comics or not? I would say it's its own separate genre. And again, uh, I compare it with how in Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces, he talks about all epics, and he gives a very good template for any and all epics, which most comic books are. But there's one type of epic which he dubs as apotheosis, 
So these spiritual comic books would correspond with that specific type of epic which relates to apotheosis. People like Alan Moore or Neil Gaiman who are well read enough to know about them or The Fountain uh, would write it to be a spiritual instruction. More commonly they are writing something they feel is a spiritual message, a very heartfelt message, but it's not so much that they understand the idea of personal evolution or initiation. It's more so that these stories are around us everywhere. You can read the Gospels of the Bible or any scripture and there's an inherent spiritual story which we will recognize because we're wired that way. So we know it's significant and we'll, the artist will include those symbols in their stories, sometimes without even knowing it. But with the ones that I'm talking about, I think they always intend them to be. Um, I noticed on your list at the end that some of the books, sorry to make you fly all the way to That's the back okay. there. Um, some of the books have actually been turned into anime cartoons. Yes. So is there anything you can tell us about how that may have transitioned into, like I see Naruto 2 and Nausicaa and Bleach on there, um, but how any of those might have come to be or what, how they might be reaching kids in a different way through cartoons? For some of the stories, they will go over people's heads, um, but for other stories, they naturally reach out to us in a way that, again, they are subconsciously ingrained in us as these powerful images even though we don't know what they are. So it's very easy to put spiritual images in a comic book or manga, or Japanese manga, and have it really appeal to them. Also, it's worth mentioning that those kind of things usually do better in Japan just because they have a much more publicly esoteric culture that they read these Germanic myths or, or stories that are based on Germanic myths and they immediately see the value in them. So it's more likely that you'll see manga or, or anime with spiritual themes becoming insanely popular than you would might find them in America. When I was little, um, I, I read comic books, but my parents read like newspapers and magazines. Mm -hmm. Who reads comic books now? Good question. They've done a very good job of making genres of comic books for all ages. Um, as you can see on the list, there's children's comic books and there's comic books which I would say are only for adults. So it's really grown into a viable artistic expression. Probably it got that way in the 70s with the underground movement of comic books in America. Uh, a lot of artists decided to take it back as a adult medium of expression. So since then that kind of thing snowballed and it grew and comic books itself is no longer a genre in itself, it's more that comic books have many genres within themselves. That's how I would answer that question.